self <laughs> Um Okay, we're bringing some chairs in. There is an overflow room next door, but I think we only have a few uh, extras, so I would suggest you just stay here and we'll get a couple of chairs. Um, so we may be interrupted in this introduction, but uh, just ignore the interruptions. Um, welcome uh, all of you to uh, the first lecture of the year for the Center for 21st Century Study. Um, I want to, before I introduce Paul Jay, I want to remind people of a couple things. Number one, just want to let you know that the talk is being uh, web streamed and archived for the web, which means that if you ask a question, your question will uh, live on the internet. If that makes you uneasy, maybe you want to hold the question afterward. But, um, I think I'm courtesy, I think that people So consider yourself informed. Also, I want to let you just uh, alert you to some coming events for this semester. Um, Friday, October 20th, no, Monday, October 20th, uh, we have a symposium counting DH scholarship. It will be about digital humanities scholarship and how that gets counted in the academy these days. That's co-sponsored with the Digital Humanities Lab. Um, Friday, October 24th, Wendy Brown, who is a scientist at UC Berkeley, will be here. Uh, Friday, November 7th, the D. Fox Carroll from the MIT, from the Artificial Intelligence Lab. Really a few talk called Phantasmal Media Poetics. Also, November 14th, Eliana Kim from UC Irvine talking about militarized flyways and migratory birds and transitional choreographies of endangerment. And Friday, November 21st, we'll be hosting the MLA Subconference Organizing Committee, a group that started over a year ago uh, as a kind of, um, let's just say, resistance movement to the MLA. And we're hosting them for a meeting here, and then they'll be making a group presentation um, on issues in the profession. The final talk for the semester will be Tom Gottin, uh Film Studies College, University of Chicago on Friday, December 5th. So we've got a busy semester, and I look forward to seeing many of you at these talks. Um, let me now uh, turn to Paul Jay. Paul Jay is a, I guess, well-wrought product of the University of California system. He did his undergraduate work both at UCLA and University of California, Santa Cruz, received his MA in English from the University of California, Berkeley, and rather than try another campus, he returned to Santa Cruz for his PhD, uh, which he received in literature in 1980. He's professor of English and a fellow at the Center for Interdisciplinary Thinking at Loyola University of Chicago. And over the course of his career, he's also taught at Caltech, Emory University, University of Connecticut, and the University of Chicago. Professor Jay's areas of specialization include modern and contemporary literature and theory, cultural theory, visual culture, the relationship between literature and globalization, and the future of the humanities in 21st century higher education. We'll be talking about uh, that this afternoon. His books include Being in the Text, Self-Representation from Wordsworth to Roland Art, uh, The Selected Correspondence of Kenneth Burke and Malcolm Howley, which is nominated for a National Book Critics Circle Award in Biography, uh, Contingency Blues, The Search for Foundations in American Criticism, published by Wisconsin Press, 1997, Global Matters, The Transnational Turn in Literary Studies, published by Cornell in 2010, and his most recent book, The Humanities Crisis and the Future of Literary Studies. His essays on literary and cultural theory, modern and contemporary lit, globalization, and border studies have appeared in a variety of academic journals, including PMLA, Callaloo, Cultural Critique, and Modern Fiction Studies. His interview with Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Juno Diaz appeared in March of 2008. And in these times, his article on how best to defend the value of the humanities in debates about higher education, the fear of being useful, which is co-authored with Gerald Graff, appeared in the January 5th, 2012 issue of Inside Higher Education. 
Professor Jay's talk today is drawn from the arguments set forth in his recent book on the humanities crisis. Uh, and the talk is not only, I think, an excellent kickoff to this year's theme at the center, which is humanities futures, but also a very, I would say, companionable follow-up to last week's Dean's Distinguished Lecture by Emeritus Professor Ian Hassan, titled Prometheus Reclaimed, The Humanities in an Age of Marketing and Technology. And I'm delighted that Professor Hassan is able to join us here this afternoon, and very pleased to invite you to join me in welcoming Paul Jay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard, for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm exhausted from my career of listening. I think I should just retire on that September. I was thinking as I was listening to Richard that the two highlights I think of, of that, that precis were uh, the many nights I spent at every university drinking vodka late into the night with Kenneth Burke, which somehow led to my editing the uh, selected letters of Kenneth Burke and Malcolm Cowley, and I got to know both of them, and that was a joy. The other highlight was when I interviewed Juno Diaz, who kept calling me dude. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like anything. But, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Richard and everybody at the center, anybody at the center who had anything to do with inviting me here to speak, uh, because it provided me the occasion to go back through uh, uh, the analysis and the arguments uh, uh, that I developed in my book and to rethink them and, and uh, try to push ahead a little bit more beyond what I've done in that book, which I just finished in January. Um, so for that opportunity alone, I want to thank you for, for, uh, for bringing me here. Um, this might be a little long, but we're all here together. It won't be that <laughs> My overarching interest this afternoon is to make some suggestions about how those of us who work in the humanities can best explain the current work that we do to administrators, boards of trustees, state legislators, students, their parents, and a broader public in a way that does justice to the rigor and the sophistication of the work we do, but at the same time will ensure the kind of buy-in necessary for the humanities to continue to have a central role in higher education. To that end, I begin by exploring some competing ways in which the humanities are conceived. Here I'll have some remarks to make about two of the rubrics from the humanities, from the uh, center's humanities futures uh, page. One which deals with temporality in the humanities, and another that focuses on controversies regarding uh, the role we can uh, it play in the humanities, or even should play in the humanities, uh, in solving real social problems. Then I'm going to shift my attention to a brief discussion of the historical role theory and critique have played in the humanities, and why I believe we should feature that role going forward. And then in the final uh, section of my remarks, I want to return to the challenges the post-humanist critique of humanism presents when we have to explain the new humanities to a pretty traditional public. And finally, I'll close with a few words about the challenge of how to reframe literary studies for a 21st century marketplace. I suppose I should have told you what the title of my talk is. Uh, critical Humanism and the Literary Futures Market. And the last part of that title is a gesture toward the really intriguing double meaning of futures that gets developed in the, in the rubric. The idea that we want to think about the future of the humanities, but we also need to think about investing, taking risks, speculating in a humanities futures market. Uh, uh, in the perhaps vain hope that there will be, in the vain and dysfunctional uh, 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 vein, that uh, uh, there'll, there'll even be a market for humanities. 
uh, in the 20th century. And I think there will be. But um, so that's why the literary market plays. Okay, so as I indicated a moment ago, when I took a look at the center's statement about its focus this year on humanity's futures, I was especially gratified that you'd invited me to speak with you because it was clear that doing so would give me an opportunity to rethink and extend the work that I began in my new book. I was particularly struck with your characterization of innovative methodologies and the need to define new research problems as speculative, both in the intellectual and financial senses of the word, as work that does not just have a value in and for itself, but work that is also an investment in an institutional future we can't yet see. Risking the untried or experimental can lead to breakthroughs and in innovation in specific research areas, but also have the effect of transforming how we think of humanism and humanities in more general kinds of ways. I want to start out by making a few comments about different ways to think about the temporality of the humanities, the temporality of the humanities. Your first rubric helps foreground the complexity of temporality in the humanities. When you describe the center's research, the center's interest in the creation and imagination of the future throughout the history of humanistic inquiry, the ways in which the humanities have always been engaged with the future as well as the past. Now, I think that if you ask most people, including many academic administrators, what the humanities are about, they'll give you some kind of historical answer. That the humanities are about the historical study of the best that's been thought and said in literature, philosophy, theology, and history, with the aim of, of identifying timeless truths to transcend the limits of an historical moment, especially of our own historical moment. And it shouldn't seem all that surprising since the humanities have their roots in humanism, which most people probably think of as having to do first with the recovery and then the dissemination and systematic study of classical texts and what many now think of as canonical works written from the Renaissance well into the 19th century. From this point of view, the humanities have a largely curatorial responsibility. This classically conservationist approach to the humanities has been articulated most clearly by Andrew Del Banco. According to Del Banco, the humanities went astray in the 1970s and 80s when criticism began to overwhelm curation, when theory and the critique of humanism took the place of the humanities' responsibility to preserve and to venerate a traditional body of knowledge. What this point of view misses, I think, is the reciprocal relationship between curation and criticism. For to a significant degree, the act of curation requires criticism. And criticism is itself a form of curation. After all, a curator doesn't just make decisions about what to feature based on quality and distinction. A curator is also critically and imaginatively involved in putting together objects in ways that produce new relations between things and new forms of knowledge. Humanity scholars and educators curate by being critical in this more capacious sense of the term. Contemporary work in the humanities is therefore curatorial in the best sense of the word. It both reorganizes old materials and gathers them together with new materials to create new perspectives on the past, the present, and the future. This means critique, by which Del Banco clearly means theory, isn't a threat to the curatorial enterprise, but rather is central to its intellectual and pedagogical vitality. Curation and critique are independent. When we articulate the value of the humanities, I think we need to emphasize not only the body of knowledge they preserve, but also the value of the forms of critique they teach, and to underscore that critique is a skill integral to both scholarly work and critical citizenship. 
One of the problems with the point uh, of view that Del Blanco advocates, of course, is that it perpetuates a, a largely static version of the humanities. Either they don't seem to have a future, or their future is largely limited to recuperating, archiving, curating, preserving the past. From this point of view, the future of the humanities is conservative in the textbook sense of the word, which of course is why most conservatives argue that the so-called crisis in the humanities can be fixed by returning to a historical study of great literature, philosophy, and art. From this point of view, contemporary theory is a problem precisely because it's contemporary. Accordingly, humanities practice a humanities practice that pays attention to power and to social justice substitutes the study of texts central to the Western tradition with a curriculum determined by a contemporary form of what's often dismissed as political correctness. For the conservative or traditionalist, the temporality of the humanities is oriented towards the past, and so the argument for ensuring its future can often seem to be that it must go backwards. To the extent that what gets dismissed as theory and political correctness are born of the present and seek to shape the future, they get scapegoated for ruining a humanity that always got its coherence from studying the past. But as your first rubric points out, the idea that the humanities are about the past and that our primary job is curation is wrong. As you point out, the humanities have always been engaged with the future as well as the past. When I read this, I was reminded of the extended discussion in my book, uh, Chapter 4. Uh, for those of you who have it, uh, I'll wait while you read it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> anyway, when I read this, I was reminded of the extended discussion in my book of the history of the core curriculum at Columbia University, which I added a ball uh, researching. There I point out that the genesis of the general ed requirements at Columbia, which eventually became the model for core curricula all over the US, emerged just after World War I with a specific focus not on the importance of studying texts from the past for their own sake, but rather with attention to contemporary texts dealing with contemporary problems that were explicitly social and political in nature, and aimed at ensuring a more peaceful future. It took decades before this model gave way to the great works model of the core, which still largely persists at Columbia. The thing about the temporality of the humanities, then, is that it can only be captured by understanding the relationship between the past, the present, and the future as fluid and reciprocal. Curating the past alters the past and appropriates it for thinking about contemporary problems, and the attempt to solve contemporary problems always pushes into the future. Of course, one of the key ways in which contemporary work in the humanities breaks with earlier work is in its critique of the meta kind of metaphysical idealism that posits a distinction between the eternal and the temporal in the first place, and which associates human nature with a timeless essence that elevates the human over nature itself. The importance of exploring critically the temporality of the humanities is that our students come to understand how the humanities embody a set of historically constructed, institutionalized, and material assumptions and practices, a perspective that undermines, the, constructively undermines, or questions the idealist notion that the humanities are about studying paternal, timeless truths about human nature embodied in texts that are important because they transcend the historical context in which they were produced and speak to the truth of the human condition. Focusing on the temporality of the humanities in the context of thinking about its futures contests this view usefully, insisting that we recognize the contingent, the interested, and the pragmatic focus of humanities work. Not solely the contingent interested in pragmatic focus, but including a contingent interested in pragmatic focus. Now, related to this way of thinking about the temporality of the humanities is the idea that they can have some kind of pragmatic function in the present. And you get at this in your fourth 
rubric, which stresses the important role of the humanities in solving, I don't do this very much, but real world problems. <laughs> um, I always wince a bit at the distinction between the ivory tower and the real world, as if academic life isn't part, it's, it's too much a part of the real world. But I agree this stress on how work in the humanities can contribute to constructive thinking about problem solving is crucial. It's also complicated and it's controversial, as you all know. Defenses of the humanities like Stanley Fish's, can't talk about the humanities without mentioning Fish. <laughs> Defenses of the humanities like Stanley Fish's, that studying the humanities has value for its own sake, but doesn't have any practical value, remember we're supposed to save the world on our own time, are openly cynical about the idea that the humanities can help to solve problems in the real world. For Fish, the focus on problem solving too often translates into the kind of work uh, critics of the humanities associate with political correctness, as if analyses of art, literature, philosophy, or history that focus on forms of social justice that persist in our own time is somehow inappropriate or contradicts the protocols of traditional humanism. But for others, it smacks, in a more general way, of reducing the value of the humanities to the pragmatic and the utilitarian when the humanities ought to be a site of resistance to the pragmatic and the utilitarian. At least a site of resistance to the reduction of value to the purely pragmatic and the utilitarian. Of course, it isn't very difficult to see how this point of view is itself an example of the humanities' focus on problem solving. In this case, the problem of our society being too fixated on the utilitarian and the, pra and the pragmatic. And of course, a lot of work in the humanities is, or should be, focused on creating rather than solving problems. But then again, to create a problem is to call attention to a problem people have missed, and therefore also helps solve a problem. From this point of view, it gets kind of difficult to see how any humanistic any humanities work isn't aimed ultimately at solving some sort of problem and therefore has a kind of practical uh, use. The more the humanities are conceived in static, historical, curatorial terms, the less they seem to be about problem solving in the real world, of course. But conversely, the more the humanities are engaged with the future, the more they're connected to problem solving, to thinking both theoretically and pragmatically about new problems that threaten the emotional, the psychological, and the physical well-being of humans, all living organisms, and the planet itself. Ah. I knew there was something. Now, it seems to me one of the biggest challenges we face is how to articulate to the broader public and to administrators, boards of trustees, state legislators, parents, students, the nature of the investment we're making in a 21st century humanities, and how this work is consistent with the continual transformation of the humanities as both a collective field of studies and a marketplace of useful ideas. As I mentioned a moment ago, many of us view the humanities as a place where we can resist marketplace values and the reduction of education to credentialing, especially in an economy so weighted toward inequality like ours. And yet, to ensure the survival of the humanities, it seems to me that we need to find a way to explain how they also teach students a useful range of transferable skills and thus allow them to invest in their own futures. One of the things that got me to writing The Humanities Crisis and the Future of Literary Studies in the first place was that the longer I read articles tracking debates about the humanities crisis, the more I found the humanities being defended in pallid, outdated ways as if the last 34 years, 30 or 40 years of humanities work had either never happened or was an embarrassment that we could just sweep under the table. This is particularly a problem in the larger public sphere where commentators like Nicholas uh, Kristof, uh, David Brooks, and a host of other uh, commentators regularly present the humanities in what for me as a humanist 
are, are profoundly outdated and embarrassing kinds of ways. Many of you probably saw Christoph's recent article entitled Don't Dismiss the Humanities in, in August in, in the New York Times, in which he insists that the humanities are important because in our culture, we don't just want tech people, but we also want musicians to awaken our souls, writers to lead us into fictional lands, and philosophers to help us exercise our minds and engage the world. Although he surely doesn't mean to, I think Christoph trivializes, trivializes the humanities here, reducing them to a kind of social philosophy he associates with Isaiah Berlin, John Rawls, and Peter Singer. Those are the three humanist dimensions in this uh, opinion piece, who he says together have shaped the world. Although his, his column opens with the question, what could the humanities be, in a, what, of what use could the humanities be in a digital age, Christoph seems never to have heard of the digital humanities, or to be aware of current work that explores the intersection between humanity, technology, and the biosphere. It's a very shrunk, narrow version of the humanities. Worse still, for me, is Brooks's recent column well, 2013, June, called The Humanist Vocation, where it was very hard for me to recognize myself uh, fully, <coughs> in which the value of humanities is presented solely, and that's the key word, solely, there's a pun there, actually, in terms of how it nurtures our inner lives. See the pun? <laughs> Just how it's for Brooks, for Brooks, and this is quoting Brooks because I don't want my language to be construed as Brooks. For Brooks, the job of the humanities was to cultivate the human core, the part of a person we might call the spirit, the soul, or in D.H. Lawrence's phrase, the dark, vast forest. I have one of those. <laughs> I don't want to be construed as criticizing this. Brooks goes on to say the humanist's job was to cultivate this, this ground, educating the emotions with art in order to refine it, offering inspiring exemplars to get it properly oriented. For Brooks, the so-called humanities crisis set in when we lost faith in this uplifting mission, when the humanities turned from an inward to an outward focus, becoming less about the old notions of truth beauty and goodness, and more about political and social categories like race, class, and gender. This is still Brooks writing. Liberal arts professors grew more moralistic, you know who you are, <laughs> when talking about politics, but more tentative about private morality because they didn't want to offend anybody. Now I think with friends like these, the humanities don't need any others. But it's not just popular commentators like Christoph and Brooks who talk about the humanities this way. When the American Academy of Arts and Sciences issued a report on the state of the humanities and social sciences called the heart of the matter, which complained that the humanities had become too cloistered, too engaged in knowledge production, disengaged from the wider social world, the world of real social problems, Fish wrote the following. That, of course, is precisely how the Academy, and especially the Humanist Academy, has traditionally been conceived, as a cloistered and separate area in which inquiry is engaged in for its own sake and not because it yields useful results. It is the rejection of this contemplative ideal in favor of various forms of instrumentalism that underlies the turn away from the humanist curriculum. The rhetoric of the report, Fish goes on, puts its authors on the side of that ideal, but when push comes to shove, they're all too ready to dilute it in the name of some large abstraction, democracy, culture, social progress, whatever. They are, in short, all too ready to depart from the heart of the matter. For Fish, then, the humanities have the same <coughs> narrow and abstract uplifting mission the same essentially inward focus they have for Brooks. Now, and this is really important, don't get me wrong. I'm not arguing that there's anything wrong with inwardness, that there's anything wrong with contemplation, 
and anything wrong with the idea that part of what we do in the humanities is deeply connected to studying and fostering inwardness and contemplation. On the contrary, I think it's true that one of the great values of a humanities education is both the exposure to inward contemplative thinking that it provides and the way it fosters attention to the inner life, no matter how you define uh, the inner life. But Brooks and Fish present the humanities in either or terms that make it all about withdrawal, inwardness, and contemplation. That's my complaint. While playing down or often ridiculing the idea that humanities work can contribute to solving real world problems that it has any kind of instrumental value at all. Brooks's insistence that studying the humanities is about nurturing the human core, educating the emotions in order to refine them with a focus on old notions of truth, beauty, and goodness, and Fisher's claim that the humanities ought to be a cloistered separate area in which inquiry is engaged for its own sake, reinforce a kind of narrow and, I think, outdated version of the humanities that I referred to a moment ago. That's not how most of us, I think, see the, the humanities. <coughs> Fish claims that the problem with the heart of the matter report is that its authors dilute the power of their defense of the humanities by trafficking in abstraction, but it's hard for me to think of a more saccharine set of abstractions uh, for characterizing humanities than, ones, than the ones we get in Christoph and uh, Brooks and, and in, in Fish too. Now, I argue in my book uh, that we need to develop a clear, effective public description of new work in the humanities that counters these kinds of descriptions, that underscores the transformed nature of the humanities and yet makes a clear and plausible case for what we do to the broader public. I think that's a real challenge. This alternative description not only needs to counter the argument that things like theory, post-humanism, and a focus on social justice are ruining the humanities, it ought to mount an aggressive defense of the positive role that theory and a focus on social and political agency and an expanded repertoire of methodologies and subject areas do play in the contemporary humanities. Emphasizing how they expand traditional work in the humanities by extending the scope of the humanities, the scope of humanism, in new, interesting, and innovative kinds of ways. We shouldn't shy away from, we should call attention to the contributions to things like post-structuralist and post-humanist theory, feminism, critical race theory, multiculturalism, eco-criticism, and queer theory have made to a transformed approach to humanistic studies. I also believe that it's in our interest to frame this work less as an outright rejection of humanism than as a critical yet constructive extension of humanism's interest in critical theories of the human and of democratic agency. Keeping in mind that we're talking here in part about how to sustain a humanities futures market, I think we need to figure out a way to sell an expanded vision of the humanities in a way that will ensure buy-in by a broad range of administrators, commentators, and the larger public, making sure they understand why the risks we are taking in the humanities are worth investing in. How should that script read? I don't know. No. Uh, how, should that script... <laughs> how should that script read? First of all, <laughs> sorry, it's a sense of humor I got from him, <laughs> from his father. Uh, first of all, so how should the script read? First of all, as I indicated a moment ago, we should argue forcefully that it's wrong for critics to complain that theory is around the humanities, since critique has been central to humanism over the course of its whole history. And we ought to rebut the idea that contemporary theory has politicized the, politicized the humanities by pointing out that Enlightenment humanism was partly about theorizing and then trying to ensure empowerment and social justice in a democratic, emerging democratic framework. 
I think it's in our interests, rhetorically and pragmatically, to draw a clear link between, and I want to emphasize, I'm talking about strategies for engaging the public. I think it's in our interest, rhetorically and pragmatically, to draw a clear link between humanism's roots in critique and the role of critical theory today in the humanities. Uh, Jerry Graff made this argument, I think pretty persuasively, way back, when you remember the late 80s, way back in the late 80s, some of us do, near the end of professing, professing literature and institutional history, when he insisted uh, that with its inquiry into assumptions, premises, and legitimating principles and concepts, literary and critical theory had much in common with the abstract, speculative and theoretical thinking of humanist philosophy and political and social theory. In my book, I define critique as the practice of systematically analyzing and interrogating the constitution of conceptual categories and, source, and the sources of their authority. Critique involves exploring the historical and conceptual development of norms that regulate our personal, social, and political lives together. It also, of course, explores the historical constitution of the we these norms are supposed to protect. For Judith Butler, writing about Foucault's approach, approach to critique, critique is about bringing into life the very framework of evaluation itself. It seems to me quite impossible to understand humanism in the 18th and 19th centuries without seeing that it evaluated the very frameworks of evaluation that had historically been used to think about things like art, truth, being, identity, rights, liberty, and power, and that therefore it makes sense to think of our own contemporary evaluation of these frameworks as extending that tradition. Butler goes so far as to insist on the relationship between critique and virtue, insisting that virtue belongs to an ethics which is not fulfilled merely by following objectively formulated rules or laws or pre-established pre norms, but that virtue is more radically a critical relation to those norms. Critique is a critical relation to norms. Seem Seen from this perspective, humanism had within it a kind of radical quality all along. It sought within its own limited terms to be virtuous because in its theoretical thinking, it developed a critical relationship with normative thinking. Even if the normativity humanism theorized turned out to be deeply flawed. Now, how do we square this idea of continuity with contemporary theories critique of or its outright, outright break with humanism. I want to say, I don't know again. I already hit that code. How do we square this idea of continuity with contemporary theory's critique of or its outright break with humanism? Again, I approach this question less in purely intellectual or theoretical terms than in rhetorical and pragmatic terms. In other words, what kind of narrative about what we do provides the most promise for ensuring that the humanities will have a future. On the one hand, there are obvious strategic advantages that come with stressing continuity between the contemporary humanities and the history of humanist inquiry. But on the other hand, stressing that continuity threatens to play down, blunt, or distort the openly anti and post forms of humanism central to much of the work currently being done under the broad rubric of post-humanism. The aim of which is to critique, subvert, reconstruct, and often to move altogether beyond humanism. I think these are vexing questions, which choice to make. And I'm still trying to fine tune my own position. In my book, I tried to scratch, sketch out a fairly moderate position, that's not something I don't often do. Uh, I tried to sketch out a fairly moderate position, developing a middle ground that proposed the continuity argument as the more pragmatically effective way to go, stressing how new work in the humanities constituted a thoroughgoing yet constructive critique of uh, the historical and conceptual limits of humanism. This position, of course, 
runs the real risk of playing down, undermining, or perhaps even distorting the force of the post in post-humanism with its clear emphasis on coming after, in both senses of the word, temporal and, and attack, uh, and moving beyond. However, as uh, Stefan Herbrechter has pointed out in his 2013 book, Post-Humanism, A Critical Analysis, the term post-humanism can have a variety of meanings that allow for a number of discursive <coughs> and argumentative strategies. Whether designating a content or a strategy, he points out neither post-humanism, post-humanity, or post-humanization presuppose any consensus. These terms, he writes, are politically, radically open. Herbrechter writes that he's in partial agreement with critics like Martin Hallowell and Andrew Mosley, who argue in their 20, oh, 2003 book, Critical Humanism's Humanist-Anti-Humanist Dialogues, that we ought to acknowledge some degree of continuity between humanism and post-humanism, even if in the final analysis he insists intellectual rigor comes down on the side of stressing a break between the two. Hollowell and Mosley argue that humanism is a complex body of thought that's too often reduced or even caricatured by its contemporary critics. By making distinctions between romantic, existential, dialogic, these are his terms, civic, spiritual, pagan, pragmatic, and technological humanisms, Hollowell and Mosley want to emphasize a critical complexity in humanism that they believe defies reduction to a monolithic body of outdated thought, insisting that much humanism contains within itself an anti-humanist thread. They put humanism in dialogue with a range of contemporary theorists in order to argue for the continuing relevance of humanism to questions about ethics, art, science, selfhood, gender, citizenship, and religion. Carrie Wolf also takes care to stress intersections between the kind of critical humanism Hollowell and Mosley call attention to and his own approach to post-humanism when he writes that the perspective on post-humanism he attempts to formulate in his 2010 book, What is Post-Humanism, doesn't, doesn't see post-humanism as surpassing or rejecting the human, but that it actually enables us to describe the human and its characteristic modes of communication, interaction, meaning, social significations, and affective investment with greater specificity once we have removed meaning from the ontologically closed domain of consciousness, reason, reflections, and so on. Don't you just love those and so on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> on the one hand, Erbrechter seems to agree with Wolf when he writes that post-humanism, or what he calls post-anthropocentrism, must be able to think the end of the human without giving in to apocalyptic mysticism or to new forms of spirituality and transcendence. And that a critical post-humanism combines, on the one hand, openness to the radical nature of technocultural change, and on the other hand, it emphasizes a certain continuity with traditions of thought that have critically engaged with humanism, and which in part have evolved out of and within the humanist tradition itself. But then on the other hand, and just a few pages later, he condemns humanism's arrogance and dismisses the idea that humanism might still be able to teach us a lesson. In this context, he laments the popular ideas of post-human humanity he laments that popular ideas of post-human humanity, augmented by technology, often continue to be influenced by ideologically naive humanist values, traditional approaches in cultural theory, and in the humanities that usually remain too anthropocentric in defense of the notion of the human. But then, he goes on to say that post-humanism should not position itself as coming after a humanism, but rather inhabits a humanism, but deconstructively. A position I don't have 
much trouble reconciling with my own. When he writes that Hollowell and Mosley succeed in complicating a monolithic view of humanism by locating a radical self-criticism already within the humanist tradition, it's hard to see how that radical self-criticism isn't related to the deconstruction he invokes. But in the end, he hesitates to fully embrace uh, Hollowell and Mosley's position, concluding that despite the humanitarian reflex, it seems unlikely, this is her record, that the contemporary techno-savvy phase of post-humanism will have a lot of patience with such an attempt at rehumanization. He says it seems unlikely that the contemporary techno-savvy phase of post-humanism will have a lot of patience with such attempts at rehumanization. In his view, the whole idea of a humanist human nature, which has served, quote, to promote the cohesion of humanity in general, close quote, has to be overturned by post-humanists. Now, I have to admit this gives me a lot of pause. It's not so much that I disagree with the arguments here, but I wonder how one sells this position as an antidote to the humanities crisis. It's one thing to complain, as Herbrechter does, that liberal humanism presupposes a bourgeois capitalist subject who promotes tolerance in the face of seemingly superficial difference, like gender, race, culture, location, history, in the name of the universal principles of humanity, perpetuating a politics of appeasement, which protects the values humanism is declared as universally valid. But it's another thing to explain this new orientation for the humanities in a way that's both understandable and appealing to university administrators and a larger public, steeped in the very ideology of humanity, this point of view is intent on overturning. If Herbrecker is right that the techno-savvy won't have much patience with a post-humanism that rehumanizes humanism, it's probably also true that traditional humanists won't have much patience with a techno-savvy post-humanism that at times seems to want to junk humanism altogether. It's very difficult to see how the approach to post-humanism in the 21st century, critics like Herbrechter articulate, can be reconciled not only with humanism, but with the model of the humanities it informed during the 19th and 20th centuries. From this point of view, the humanities crisis has less to do with intellectual protests about theory and political correctness, or the corporatization of higher education, and it has more to do with intellectual and theoretical developments within the humanities themselves that seem to render them outdated as an organizing principle for the study of the human, which has been cut loose seemingly from its privileged status and then recontextualized the human within intersecting biological, animal, technological, and, and ecological systems. The approach to the human envisioned by post-humanism seems to require a reconfigured disciplinary framework in which the traditional disciplines of the humanities need to be stitched together with biology, computer science, cognitive science, and environmental studies. The constellation of disciplines currently getting organized around the study of the Anthropocene. The key point about post-humanist theory, then, is that its critique of humanism implies a critique of traditional disciplinary structures as well. As well. It may be that to decenter the human in the humanities is to undo the very logic of the humanities themselves as they've been traditionally configured. Post-humanism confronts us with the challenge of constructing a post-hierarchical study of the human in which the very idea of humanity is recontextualized in relationship to a whole range of other systems not normally or traditionally associated with humanities. Just as in his proposal for the study of globalization, Arjun Apatara insisted we need to focus on a set of intersecting scapes, media scapes, finance scapes, <coughs> ethnoscapes, technoscapes, finance scapes, those are his scapes, what we have been calling the humanities may need to be reconfigured in order to study the human 
in the context of intersecting biospheres, technospheres, and ecospheres, so that the humanities get expanded to include more of the disciplines usually associated with a broader liberal arts education, including, of course, some of the STEM disciplines. Now, in this radical scenario, the humanities in the 21st century might preside over its own undoing, or at least redoing, which, and redoings often end up being undoings. The humanities futures market might turn on a declaration of bankruptcy and a complete restructuring, a divestment of our humanities portfolio in order to reinvest in a new expanded set of disciplinary structures. We would, of course, continue a critical study with our students of the history of humanism and of the humanities, but in a transformed context that stressed the continuous unfolding of ever more complicated ways to think about the human in relationship to its complex independence with and effect on other species, technologies, and ecologies. Of course, while the logic of post-humanism suggests not only that this argument for structural change can be made, it even suggests that it should be made. And it risks, the risks in investing in such a change, of course, are considerable. Should we continue to stress the value of the traditional model of the humanities in an increasingly post-industrial age technological world in which the intersection of the human, the animal, ecology systems, and technology is becoming increasingly complex? or feature the new complexity of these relationships as the point of departure for a revised and expanded conception of humanism and the humanities. I think the second approach is certainly preferable to the first, but the big question is how to characterize complicated new and evolving models of humanistic inquiry that makes sense to administrators, boards of trustees, state legislators, and the broader public in a way that moves them to continue to fund the humanities. The initial challenge, of course, is to develop a consensus about the scope of the humanities in the 21st century, to design a humanities practice for the future that ensures that we'll have a future, but then the bigger challenge may be to develop a language for describing this new humanities that makes sense to people who understand them in pretty conventional terms. In my view, we need to work out a language strategically calibrated to underscore the value of theory and critique, the significance of new innovative methodologies, and a vision of the humanities that links up with some of the STEM disciplines, yet still provides our students with a core education in the history of humanistic thought across the traditional uh, disciplines of the humanities. Okay, in closing, sounds like I'm gonna take less time than I am, uh, but I wanna turn in closing to the literary futures market, my own field of literary space. If contemporary theories critique of the human has dramatically disrupted the humanities, so too has its critique of literature disrupted the traditional orientation of literary studies. Just as recent work in the humanities has stressed the contingent, interested, limited, and constructive nature of the human in humanism, recent work in literary studies has stressed the contingent, interested, limited, and constructive nature of literature. If the decentering, if the decentering of the human in the humanities has led to a thorough rethinking of the nature and configuration of the humanities, so too has the decentering of literature in literary studies led to a multiple uh, set of reconfigurings and disruptions. Risk speculation, disinvestment, and the development of new speculative, critical, and theoretical portfolios are as common to the literary futures marketplace as they are to the larger marketplace of the humanities. The shift I'm referring to uh, can be captured by thinking about the difference between talking about studying literature and talking about literary studies talking about studying literature versus talking about literary studies. 
where many administrators, students, their parents, and the larger public think of English and comparative literature as comprising the historical study of literature itself, conceived as imaginative writing in the form of poetry, drama, and short stories in the novel, by at least the mid-1980s, the idea of literature itself had been subjected to a thorough critique along the same lines as the idea of the human itself. But the idea there's no such thing as literature itself would probably come as news to most people outside the academy. One way to mark the transformative effects of theory in this regard is by tracing the disciplinary shift from literature to the literary, which undid the stability of the category literature by pointing out that how we define the concept literary helps determine what we teach as literature, and that conversely, what we teach in literature courses helps determine how we define literary, and that other cultural material, many other cultural media become literary uh, when we teach them in literature courses. This means that neither literature nor literary constitute fixed, stable categories or objects of knowledge. Of course, the more attention we began to pay to how the concepts literature and liter literary have been theorized, and the more we came to recognize that both are the products of theoretical thinking rather than objects in and of themselves with inherent properties, the more we began, the more we began to focus on the social construction of our knowledge, on interpretive practices, and on reading. Two things happened at once in the wake of these developments. Well, probably more than that, but two things, at least two important things, happened once in the wake of these developments. The organization of the study of literature around literature narrowly defined began to come undone as critics turned their attention to the reading and analysis of a whole variety of cultural media, film, television, advertising, a whole range of popular cultural forms, number one. And number two, literary studies sharpened its metacritical focus so that the historical, theoretical, and ideological construction of the literary and the methods by which we study it began to challenge literature itself as the primary object of knowledge in literary studies. All of this helped foster an increased focus on the teaching of what I like to call critical literacies. Not as opposed to teaching literature, but in the context of teaching literature. A focus on teaching critical literacies, not as opposed to, but in the context of teaching literature. What were these newly emphasized literacies? The ability to think theoretically and conceptually about common sense assumptions concerning things like uh, textuality, authorship, and literary production, to both perform interpretations of a range of cultural media and to think conceptually about the act of interpretation, and to learn to read closely, differently, and ethically. To a significant degree, these critical literacies now compete for centrality in literary studies with literacy defined in terms of knowing something about great writers and their texts. So you've got literacy defined as knowing something about great writers and texts and what I'm calling critical literacy. And critical literacy has been pushing, there's tension, there's productive tension between, between those two. Um, it seems to me that the literary futures marketplace has increasingly diversified its portfolio by investing in the study of the literary broadly defined and in teaching literacies. Of course, all these words, literature, literary, literacy, are deeply intertwined with one another. Literacy de derives from literate, one who knows letters, and letters, of course, morphed over time from referring to alphabetic signs to referring to missives, notes, documents, records, to writing in general, and eventually literature in the bell that sense of literature. To be lettered was to have become learned, educated, and schooled. By the 13th century, letters meant the profession of authorship of literature and was beginning to inform the modern sense of literary in the humanities, historical knowledge about bell left. But critical literacy has to do with those literacies I listed a moment, a moment ago. Skills or competencies related to theoretical and analytical thinking, interpretation, reading, and critical writing. 
this kind of literacy, of course, can't be divorced from the kind of literacy associated with knowing authors and literary texts, because it should be in the act of analyzing these texts that students develop and sharpen their critical literacy. But literacy isn't literature, nor is literacy the same thing as <coughs> literary. Literary means of or pertaining to literature, but literary is also a mode of being, a kind of style rather than a thing. Literary, liter, literary refers to forms and styles, to devices. It also refers to merit. But not to put too fine a phenomenological turn on it, literary is, in a way, both a mode of being and a way of looking at things, a kind of developed sensibility that can inform the way we engage with a whole range of things that are, well, not strictly speaking, literary. Literary isn't a fixed pre-existing thing, but a fluid category. And of course, literary is also a kind of competency, a way of focusing our approach to phenomena of all kinds. You can take a literary approach to anything. And it's a kind of disposition that shapes the way we read and, all, and analyze virtually everything. To become a literary person is to learn a lot about literature, but it, it also means to begin to see the world in a literary kind of way. Now, for Catherine Hales, this shift from literature to literary and literacies suggests the emergence of a transformed disciplinary coherence. And I want to finish up with this idea of what a reconfigured disciplinary coherence should be. When she write, writing at the end of her 2011 essay, How We Read, Close Hyper Machine, she asks the following question and then answers it. This is Hales. What transformed disciplinary coherence might literary studies embrace? Here is a suggestion. Literary studies teaches literacies across a range of media forms, including print and digital, and focuses on interpretation and analysis of patterns, meaning, and context through close, hyper, and machine reading practices. Reading has always been constituted through complex and diverse practices. Now it's time to rethink what reading is and how it works in the rich, rich mixture of words and images, sounds and animations, graphics and letters that constitute the environments of 21st century literacies. What's really breathtaking there is her vision of uh, literary studies doesn't use the word literature once. The word doesn't come up. It's sort of a measure of where <coughs> Some, some of us are at. So that's Hales. Hales' vision of a transformed coherence for literary studies exemplifies what happens when the study of literature itself gets displaced from the center of disciplinary coherence and is replaced by attention to a range of literacies grounded in the study of a broad group of media forms. Paramount among these literacies, of course, is reading. In her essay, Hales goes so far as to argue that reading is, quote, the sacred icon of literary studies, close quote, that it constitutes what she calls the essence of the disciplinarity of literary studies. The disciplinary identity of literary studies is the teaching of reading. Of course, Hales is, isn't the only one who insists that what we really teach is reading, right, Jane? Marjorie. Garber has made this argument in her manifesto for literary studies, and so has Jane, who wrote in The Ethics of Reading that close reading is a widely applicable skill that has always been the most valuable thing English ever had to offer. That we become a discipline, we became a discipline, sorry, while well, we stopped being amateur historians and became instead painstaking close readers. Seen in this context, Hales' reconfiguration of literary studies around reading rather than literature doesn't look all that radical. Of course, like conceptions of post-humanist humanism I discussed earlier, this reconfiguration of literary studies is bound to strike some administrators, students, and their parents and the broader public as a kind of confusing, even dramatic break with their sense of the traditional coherence of literary studies. 
not to mention many professors of literary studies who feel committed to the centrality of teaching literature and who are wary of shifting the emphasis to literacies. We had a good discussion about this problem this morning. In a way, shifting from a focus on literature to a focus on reading and the other literacies I mentioned, especially in the context, context of expanding uh, uh, the study of the literary across a host of other media, will seem to the broader public as a pretty radical and confusing shift from humanism to post-humanism, from the best that's been thought and written to the Anthropocene and cyborgs. This brings us full circle back to debates. Full circles always suggest endings. This brings us full circle back to debates about how to invest in the humanities futures market by reaffirming the enduring value of humanistic knowledge or by stressing new approaches to recontextualizing the human and stressing how the humanities teach transferable skills that can help students contribute to the solving of concrete social problems now and in the future. Which one? A vision of disciplinary, disciplinary coherence for literary studies, like the one Hales sketches out, with its focus on contemporary technologies and medias, including but not limited <coughs> to print literature, and its commitment to fostering 21st century literacies, has the advantage of stressing the contemporary relevance of literary studies, and so makes it look like a reasonable investment for students to make. I'm still haunted by who was the person who told the story this morning about the graduate student who came in with his father? Yeah, the graduate student in the MA program came in with his father, and his father really put you on the spot about what's this MA, what's my like, spot with me? Yeah, what's my, what is his son? I'm looking at, what is this going to be for? What's it going to be worth? What vocation will you have? In a way, Hales sketches up an approach to literary studies that makes it seem like a reasonable investment because it's so forward looking. But such a re reorientation, of course, comes at a cost. It breaks in perhaps confusing ways with the conception of literary studies most people outside the academy have. And with its stress on technology and literacies, it seems to step back from the idea that, that the study of literature has a value in itself, which I think it is. And that what is central to that value is the way in which the study of literature provides a framework for students to think and operate outside the world of the surely practical and utilitarian, which is important. For those who value the study of literature as an intangible good, or go further and value the study of literature as a site of resistance to the technological and the practical, or see it as primarily about exposure to a canon of great works, Hales's vision of disciplinary coherence will be a hard sell, an investment in a literary futures market many may not want to make, especially people who want to fund us may not want to make. Now, I find a lot to like in Hales's vision of a transformed humanities, but I think it's missing at least two key words. For me, those two key words are history and aesthetic, the words history and aesthetic, I would want to add in. I'd be much more comfortable with what she lays out if she'd written that, quote, literary studies teaches literacies across a historical range of media forms, including print and digital. She probably meant that, but she didn't say it, and that's important. And I'd be more comfortable with her vision if she included in her stress on the analysis of patterns, attention to the aesthetic devices writers use, and to the creation and representation of aesthetic experience, the creation and representation of aesthetic experience in the text that we read. While aesthetic theory from Kant and Schiller to Schopenhauer was submitted to extraordinarily ideological scrutiny by critics like Terry Eagleton on the left, there's very interesting new work being done in this area uh, uh, by critics like Isabel Armstrong and Cyan Nye. And it seems to me that any reconfigured approach to literary and cultural studies has to find a way to identify, account for, and analyze the nature and role of aesthetic experience in the literary and the visual arts 
and in popular culture generally. The kind of vision that Hales outlines would have a lot more traction with a more general audience if it included these elements and if it stressed a continued engagement with the history, the long history of literary production. Of course, what's striking about the kind of disciplinary coherence Hales outlines is the engagement it envisions between literature, digital media, and visual culture. Keeping in mind the larger sweep of the work Hales has been doing in the field of posthumanism, she calls attention to the ways in which the future of the humanities is increasingly connected to the future of the STEM disciplines, to the intersection of art, science, and technology. It's not as if literary studies have not been interdisciplinary nearly forever, of course, but when we look at the full sweep of new work in literary studies, we're talking about an interdisciplinarity that departs from the older post-structuralist interdisciplinarity of linguistics, philosophy, psychoanalysis, and political theory. It adds to the mix computer science, biology, neuroscience, geology, and cartography, among others. It's not that any single new development in literary studies, the new aesthetics, the use of neuroscience and cognitive theory to understand literary and aesthetic experience, the study of digital media, eco-criticism, geo-criticism, literary cartography, or cybernetics. It's not as if any one of those represents a silver bullet that's going to save literary studies. The point is that the new constellation of work, this new constellation of work, that both digs back into the archive of humanism using contemporary critical and digital tools, and work that explores the contemporary field of cultural production, that, that promise to change the present and transform imagined futures, can in tandem begin to help forge the kind of new coherence Hales only partly, I think, sketches out. Now, I should confess that talk about disciplinary, talk about disciplinary coherence has always made me nervous. Why? For one thing, more often than not, calls for a return to coherence are thinly veiled attempts to jump theory in forms of social and political criticism in order to get back to teaching literature itself. In this context, it's worth reminding ourselves that there's never really been a principle of coherence in literary studies, or at least not one that ever lasted very long. The, battle, the battlefield of literary studies is littered with the corpses of coherence. <laughs> philology, literary history, practical criticism, and formalism, to name just a few. The idea that either literature itself or close reading have always been the traditional principles of coherence in literary studies doesn't really hold much water, either because the number of years either one of these helps way is limited. Even if you grant that the close reading of canonical literary works was at the center of literary studies from sometime in the 30s to the end of the 1960s, that's only 40 years a period of time eclipsed by the primacy of the combined and decentering constellations of post-structuralism, feminism, and historicism, and post-colonial studies, the combined range, range of which has stretched now over 44 years, and the clock is still ticking. And the shift away from the old coherence promises to continue under the sway of post-humanism and the digital humanities. So what coherence? For this reason, if we need a model of coherence for literary studies, and I promise I'm almost done, if we need a model of coherence for literary studies, it probably ought to be constructed around the idea of a network rather than around the idea of an object. Around the idea of a network, not an object, and not a set of literacies. Around a network. It seems to me the kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity associated with literary studies, whether associated with post-structuralism or more recently with post-humanism has already produced a network model for literary studies. From this point of view, literary studies has actually not become incoherent. It's become increasingly networked and complexly networked, defined by an intersecting system of cultural forms to be studied and theories and methodologies with which to study them. Literary study can no longer be limited to the study of a single form, literature, nor can the study it oversees be governed by a single, limited, or circumscribed set of theories and methodologies. It seems to me that the crucial cross points are narrative 
representation and interpretation in this network, but that the particular forms of representation we study have become less important than the study of representation itself. In my view, representation and the role it plays not just in the dissemination of knowledge, but in the very production of knowledge, stands near the very center of the network we call literary studies. And so does narrative. For the study of particular kinds of narrative has also become less important, or at least as important as, the study of the constitutive role narrative construction plays, not only in the construction of knowledge, but in the very constitution of what we take to be a reality. And certainly for the humanities, this network focused on representation and narrative are crucial for our historical understanding of the construction of the human and its relationship to nature and technology. But this network wouldn't be complete without foregrounding the theories, methodologies, and interpretive competencies fostered by literary studies. Here, the literacies hails features and which I've been discussing have to get plugged into the network model I'm envisioning as well. This network model of literary studies would expand on the literacies model Hales has proposed, combining her vision of coherence with the ones I've just outlined, we get something like this. Literary study in the 21st century trains students in the historical study of narrative and poetic representation across a variety of cultural media, print, digital, and visual, offline, as well as on, understood in their aesthetic, historical, cultural, and political dimensions. Literary study helps students develop knowledge in both traditional and non-traditional subject areas, to explore the history of literary production within a diverse cultural, national, and transnational framework, and to examine narrative and poetic representation in an appropriate range of other cultural forms linked by their engagement with storytelling. Literary study also fosters proficiency in reading, analytical, interpretive, writing, and critical thinking, proficiencies used in the discipline, disciplines of literary and cultural studies, but which will also be of use to students in a wide range of vocational environments. This kind of network model of coherence is more expansive than Hales's because I think the literary futures marketplace will require buy-in across a range of constituencies for more traditional academics and administrators, the broader public, and those in the humanities who are doing dramatically new work and drawing on contemporary theories and methodologies that have challenged the very foundations of humanism and the academic disciplines it's historically configured. My own speculation is that risk has to be born among all of these groups that a 21st century approach to the humanities in general and to literary studies in particular has to connect traditional work in the historical periods of English, American, comparative, and transnational literature <coughs> with the kind of work we associate with cultural studies and now with post-humanism and the digital humanities. Those who embrace a more traditional approach to literary studies ought to have an important place within the network framework I've outlined. And those whose work is highly speculative and theoretical, work that stretches the boundaries both of the knowledge areas and critical theories <coughs> traditionally associated with work in the humanities, should also should have the disciplinary and interdisciplinary space as well to do the work that they do. And we all need to be comfortable with featuring literacies as well, the teaching of transferable competencies students can adapt and use no matter what field they go into. It won't do to take a dismissively high-minded approach here, I think, and insist that the humanities are above all that, and that we're all, what we're all about has nothing to do with teaching any skills. It does, and not least when it systematically questions the reduction of value to marketplace skills and insists that the humanities have a value that transcends vocation and credentialing. The ability to diagnose a problem like that 
to explain why it's a problem, and then work out a critical response to it, is a skill that humanities are well positioned to teach, and one that is of the utmost importance in our own time when higher education is being increasingly trivialized by the corporatization of its, of its institutions, its values, and its practices. Thank you. beginning in the early 80s and going back even further to now that it, 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 you were missing in the talk because I didn't put it in there. And so I understand why you're seeing the talk that way. But in the, in the, uh, the way I historicize the humanities crisis in the first chapter of my book is, is, is to point out that the humanities have always been thought of as in, as in crisis and you know, over the whole course of the 20th century. And it's very easy to find in the 20s, the 40s, the 60s, before we even get to the 80s, uh, complaints about professionalization among the faculty, ruining the humanities, too much work in criticism, research, theory, ruining the humanities. That, then that gets connected in the early 80s to the critique of, of critical theory as we know it, and then by the, by the late 80s and 90s, political correctness, multiculturalism become, becomes the cudgel people keep uh, hitting us over the head with, our heads with. And the argument I make is that uh, 
the idea that humanity is a crisis is a sort of banal argument because it's a, it keeps recirculating the same sorts of complaints that have to do, I think, fundamentally with professional approaches to the study of literature and culture that, that more traditional people think are, are spoiling the humanities. But what's, what's, what's different about the humanities crisis these days, you're right, is that it's largely, I think it's, it's I argue in the, in the chapter that it's largely a budgetary crisis uh, driven by the, uh, by the recession that set in in, in 2010, which, which merged perfectly with the, with the accelerating corporatization of higher education uh, to create uh, increasingly a way of thinking about about the value that's that's a bottom line way of thinking about value. At the same time that corporate values are beginning to determine budget choices in higher education and, and uh, students and their parents like the ones that came into your office are, are worried about how a student's education is, is going to affect them when they go on the job market. And that, that that's the that's the the if there's a if there's a part of the crisis of the humanities that's new, it's that, that's the part. Mm -hmm. and that, and that, yeah, I can I just go back yeah. real quick? Yeah. And then yeah. I can have the thoughts that we want to talk. And, um, uh, so I don't disagree with anything that you just said, but it, it, it leaves me still puzzled about what the thing you're doing. Because I, first of all, agree that there has been as far back as I know a crisis in the humanities. I completely agree with that. And, um, and I certainly agree with what, it, what is different about the crisis now. But what I don't understand is why you're using so much of the language of 20 years ago or 25 years ago to talk about the crisis now, right? So, because that's different than saying there's always been, because that goes back much further than 1989. And I, I feel like, I feel like if you're looking at the crisis in the humanities now, the difference between literature and theory doesn't matter at all. That kind of crisis in the humanities is about at all. That was actually a real fight in the 80s yeah, yeah. and in the 70s. And so I feel like, yeah. you, like the the stuff about theory and political correctness are actually not the right arguments to have now because that's not what the current crisis is. Those were the terms 25 years ago. Yeah. Those are not the terms. Yeah, so let me just piggyback on that just to try to speak things up. It's possible when this goes down there. <laughs> I, I, I finally got around to it just now talking about the humanities <coughs> crisis. That's what I've been thinking all along. Is what is yeah. different about the humanities crisis today is it's not a crisis in the humanities, it's a crisis in higher education sure. and public funding and support yeah. for higher education. Yeah. And so I think to Jay's point is therefore yeah. my mind will shake it because. It, although there has been a crisis of the humanities forever, this is a very different crisis. This is about labor, uh, you know, and connected with the right. kind of adjunct of right. the profession and things right. like that. Right. I understand that. That, well, that wasn't the subject of my talk. The, 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 the subject of my talk had more to do with what I think is the importance of describing the, the kind of work we do in an accurate sort of way that foregrounds the, the deep impact that uh, theoretical and political work in the humanities has, has had uh, from the early 80s to now. I'm not saying that, I'm not, it's not that I'm arguing that the contemporary crisis in the humanities is still being caused by theory. I'm saying that one of the big problems I see with the ways in which people are responding to the crunch that the humanities are, are experience, is experiencing uh, uh, is to define and describe what the humanities are in a way that uh, acts as if the kind of work we've been doing over the last 30 or 40 years never had. That's all. That's what in in the public sphere of debate about the humanities. <coughs> so I I think you're both absolutely right, and 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 I'm clear about this in the book that the the, the problems with the humanities today that we call a crisis are connected to a larger crisis in higher education that has to do with the corporatization of higher education that has to do with funding and budgetary stuff. I'm very upfront about that from the beginning of the book. Um, 
So I hear what you're saying, and I, I think you're right. Right? Uh. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, just the previous discussion uh, seems to hinge a lot on the concept of newness. You know, what is new? And, you know, you're talking about your practice of different patterns. So, so my question is this. Um, you know, when you were talking about the temporary relation of humanities, you were talking about the relation of the past, present, the future. Your account of the humanities itself is a temporizing gesture, yeah. right? And that aligns very well with the notion of the temporality, the temporal arc indicated by multiple futures, the future is market, the market is future. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if there's another way of temporizing that might be possible. And, and I hear you completely about literacy and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the study of literature that you're talking about, but for the fun of it, let me just, uh, for example, that uh, sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> talk about um, the defense of poetry written by Shelley in 1820. Okay, which is actually interesting because we talked about Professor Hassan's uh, talk last week was from Prometheus Reclaimed and Shelley Prometheus Unbound, etc. But defense of poetry, when, when my students routinely tell me that they feel that they're reading a defense of humanities written today. Sure. You know? Yeah. So if you think about what what happens when we emphasize repetition, return, mm -hmm. right? And how does that possibly steer the conversation away from the framework of crisis and the very over-determined temporal framework that the narrative of crisis seeks to impose on, on, on the humanities. In other words, can there be a defense of the humanities narrative on another register altogether on another yeah. temporal? Well, a lot of the, the uh, first chapter of my book, The Humanities Crisis Then and Now, is, is, is precisely about that. I mean, the, 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 one of the main points of that chapter is to point out the circular, repetitive nature of the rhetoric of crisis in the humanities. Uh, that you can trace it back, not only can you trace it all the way back to the, to the early part of the 20th century, but yeah, you can, you can trace it all the way back to Shelley's defense of poetry. Something I mentioned this morning, I talked about this this morning, and the, the point I made this morning, which comes out of the book, is that I think that means that what we, what we call, the humanities can't be in crisis for 100 years. A crisis is a, a moment of imminent collapse and, and break that has to be resolved in some sort of way. You can't have a whole constellation of disciplines in crisis for, for 100 years. That seems to suggest that crisis is the wrong word. And part of what I argue in the book is that, is that the more we buy into the rhetoric of crisis, the more we're sort of perpetuating the very crisis that we're trying to, to deal with. And that the history of the humanities is the history of a circular, repetitive uh, 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 debate about crisis, which I argue is, is mistaken in the sense that what we're really talking about are, are structural elements related to the kind of knowledge we explore in the humanities, uh, the, the, the way we teach, the way we, the way we try and get our students to think, the kind of research that, that we have them do. We, we, we deal with, we deal with uh, issues, topics, people, movements uh, that, uh, that are inherently in tension and the subjects are unstable and the methodologies we use are very, one at the same time very different than other disciplines and, and borrow from those disciplines. I think there's a whole set of structural reasons why people can't figure out what the hell we're doing and why it's important and, and that that's probably never going to change. So I think you're absolutely right that, that exploring the repetition and circularity of debates about the humanity, that that's a kind of temper, there's a kind of temporality there too, you know, that ought to temporize it a bit. It's a subject I got really interested in. Yeah, because as soon as I started uh, researching if you do a search for humanities crisis, you know, uh, uh, a journal search or whatever, you'll find there's never been a time when the humanities weren't in crisis. Well, maybe um, it might be helpful to sort of get beyond perhaps the kind of the liberal humanistic model, and perhaps uh, maybe the um, 
crisis and the absence of crisis that, um, in the sense that we're experiencing, is that perhaps that's a liberal um, uh, tradition, right? Itself is being exhausted. I mean, Alexander Kojav, in his you know uh, work on post-history, but makes sort of the remark that at a certain point within post-history, right, there's nothing left to say, right? Everything, in, in a sense, has already been said. Um, and you know, of course, um, I mean, even uh, you know during the um, uh, you know, 90s when I was a grad student, I mean, sometimes a complaint would be, well, I don't feel like I have anything more to add, right? Yeah. That's, that's, everything has been said about, you know, literary text A or, or, or whatever. But I, I think as, as perhaps an alternative, I mean, you know, because on the one hand, it, it seems that, you know, the humanities are um, useless, but then on the other hand, they're incredibly, you know, subversive and powerful, right? Um, and that it seems to me that the, um, the, the fact that we're kind of you know, trying to defend uh, the humanities, uh, it seems to take, it seems to, in, in some sense, lose coherence. The more that we try to, you know, focus on um, the audience, I, 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 I suppose, before whom we are, uh, uh, you know, mounting a, a defense of that. And so, you know, I, I was wondering, I mean, certainly, like, um, you, you could say that among certain people, you know, like, for example, um, you know, Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, I mean, his mentor was René Girard. I mean, he's, he's someone who very deeply, you know, values the humanities. In fact, I've, yeah. I've gone to conferences, right, um, yeah. that he personally, you know, sponsors out of his own, you know, fortune. I mean, yeah. you know, so um, I mean, there's, you know, so so we could say that there's also a certain element of, of perhaps um, uh, elitism, right? That, I mean, that that might be at work you know, here, and perhaps, a, and then maybe a second more broader point. Right, that work where specifically? In well, the Perhaps in the defunding of, hum of the humanities in, in certain ah. areas, and then perhaps the um, uh, the uh, maintenance of them in, in others, right? That um, in, you know that, that certainly we um, I, I guess perhaps as a result of the sort of the Kantian legacy, right? We don't we tend to uh, make a, a draw a division fairly you know firmly between you know the practical and the contemplative, right? Or or the um, interest and disinterest. You know, but it seems to me that. Um, that you know, that's not the only way to view the humanities. In fact, um, they, at a certain level, you know, you could say that they do, you know, um, provide you know, very uh, useful and concrete knowledge about the world. In fact, you know, the humanities in, in the Asian tradition and the Chinese tradition is all about you know how to uh, educate the ruler. Sure. So, so maybe we should be educating rulers. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, we do educate rulers. <laughs> yeah. Well, we never know how they're going to try to rule their kind of exercise over us, I suppose. I mean, there's no guarantee that a, that a humanistic education is, is, going to, is going to create a humane ruler, right? I mean, you know, e Eagleton is in, in uh, introduction to literary theory has that classic moment where he said that, you know, the, the guys who ran the death camps, you know, during the day would go home and return at night. So. Uh, there's, but so there's no guarantee that a education in the classics or in critical thinking or in whatever is going to produce the ideal leader. I, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know how you do that. I, I, would, I wish I could bother. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I love the turn at the end towards this uh, networked model of the literary. Um, so it started with that, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> so answered my answered my question of, of where is the literary and the humanities. Yeah. Um, and within that model, you said, and I think this is right, that the, the central nodes in this network are narrative, representation, and interpretation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I get narrative, I get interpretation, but why representation in there as one of these central pieces? Oh, I guess because I love teaching about representation, and I find that my students really come alive when they uh, begin to think about the way in which the world that they experience as the real has been mediated by by language and and, and aesthetic and rhetorical forms. Um, um, it's it's it seems to me that a very at a very deep level that's what we what we teach in literature and, and what we teach about about art we teach about we're teaching students to pay attention to to the to the power that comes from the power that that comes from being able to control representation whoever controls representation 
as, as a power. Uh, uh, but also, students become aware of, of a powerful way of understanding the world by being able to understand how what they're experiencing are representations and that, that, that part of being a responsible citizen and just living in the world is learning how to identify and manage representations. I mean, maybe representation falls under the heading of narrative and the two sort of overlap so much that, that maybe I only need two terms. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I just find, and I teach contemporary critical theory every semester, and um, we talk a lot about representing. Um, I have this whole rap now about repre representing and representing, you know, <laughs> from the hood, the hood notion of representing. And that, I mean, it sounds so stupid, but I, I have this slide I put up of uh, these uh, Eminem and a couple of other rappers dressed in all their regalia, you know, and I said, here's rappers, here's rappers representing. And then there's a picture of the same guys in suits. And I say, here's rappers not represented. But what, and I have them read, I have them read the Urban Dictionary uh, 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 definitions of, of representing. And we, and we connect representing uh, in the vernacular sense of the term to representation. And they, they, get, they get something, uh, they get something that they haven't thought about before. So it may just be my own idiosyncratic. I mean, it is one of those, it's a key term, and for a while I used this textbook from McLaughlin, Lynn Tricia, Critical Terms for Literary Studies, you know that book. And there's a good article, the article on representation is by uh, W.J.T. Mitchell. And, and uh, I use that essay a lot. I used that textbook for a few years until I got sick of it. And um, th that essay just really, really worked for students. So I think it's, it's probably just comes out of my own experience. As a as a teacher, you know, but I, it does sort of overlap with, with the area. But I'm glad you like the network. I just, I mean, that, I came up with that as I was writing the lecture. And we do uh, two more questions. Yeah. We have a lovely reception upstairs. We we'll continue Go ahead. conversation. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. I also like the network um, conversation, but I um, and I, I really enjoyed reading a lot of um, or both. <laughs> really intrigued the conclusion of your book. <laughs> but um, I did have a question about um, the way that we're talking about, you know, getting these various, um, uh, did we call them stakeholders earlier? Is that what we call them? Yeah. The various stakeholders to buy into the humanities. Who was that? Right. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I like the... I appreciated the acknowledgement that there were various stakeholders. I, I can't seem to, in, in my mind, while understanding that the crisis in the humanities is not um, time bound to the presence and that it's continued on, um, that it has a history, but I, I think I agree with um, a couple of the commenters that the way that the humanities is, the nature of the crisis of the humanities right now seems inseparable from the economic. Um, yeah. So the way that it's, it's asked to be, the way that it's asking to justify, the way that it's asking to justify, the way that it's being asked to justify itself is kind of inseparable for me from those kinds of concerns. So sure. I guess I'm wondering, um, and I'm on the fence about this, and some, some days, like Mondays in particular, I see that, uh, you know, yes, perhaps we, in order to simply survive, we need to adopt a kind of language or a way of talking that may um, uh, a way of talking that, that makes sense to let's say administrators, right? And then other on other days I feel like that's very dangerous territory and sure. that maybe um, yeah. maybe is the humanities um, indeed if it's always in crisis, maybe it's it's the role of the humanities to always be the bastard underdog who yeah. has to fight. In order to stay, well, you know, as pleasant yeah. as it is, um, is there any space you think in your your thinking? I wonder what you think. Is there any space to just for that kind of resistance? And, 
Sure, there's space for it, and, and it's a space I'm comfortable inhabiting, and I think it's an important space, but I don't think it can be the whole yeah. space. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I got at this a bit, I think, in my talk, and, and, and in the book, I come back to this a lot. The idea that, uh, on the one hand, I mean, getting back to the crisis being, being to a significant degree, one that's related to economic, labor matters, and the corporatization of higher education. On the one hand, it seems like, yeah, we got, all this stuff is so odious in a, in a clear kind of way that we ought to just, the temptation to just throw down the gauntlet is, is there, and I, I feel it too. But on the other hand, it seems to me that, I mean, it seems to me, I keep coming back to the father who came in, <laughs> I mean, students, and I think it's legitimate for students and, and parents to worry about or think about and have questions about what the relationship is between their children's education and what they're going to do, what they're going to be enabled to do when, when they graduate. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, at, but then it's a slippery slope to, I mean, I want to say I think we need to, I am saying I think we need to take those concerns seriously and I think we need to find a language for, for talking with people about those concerns and, and, and answering questions the best we can about what, what the value of the humanities education is above the, it has a value for its own sake, don't mm -hmm. bother me anymore, sort of answer. And, and it's, 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 I feel conflicted about, about that, having to engage in that kind of way, but I think we have to. I don't think these pressures are going to go away. I don't think people are suddenly going to say, oh, you people in managed just go on doing what you're doing. We don't care anymore about what, what, you know, what the value is of what you're doing. I think, I think we're in a tough fight, and we need to engage, find a way to engage rhetorically and strategically in the language of the, of the uh, antagonist. But Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Brother's privilege. Yeah. <laughs> Can I call on you? Yeah. Jason, you know. Oh, Jason was good. Yeah. We call it Jason. It follows on Laurie's question a little bit. I mean, you started off when you were talking about persuading legislators. I heard a lot of rhetoric of sell and market, right? And then, yeah, uh, well, that's his fault, because I was playing a little bit too much. For what place play <laughs> okay. for, the, for now, I think that you gave a, a, an account that I think many people are interested in and persuaded by, but we're a group of professors. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering, you know, what I didn't hear was something that could go to the state house. I just don't feel like the, the yeah. road to... Like, well, I teach at a private Catholic university. Yeah, well, I still don't... I mean, there's yeah, another one I have for Hales. I hear what you're saying. So yeah. I'm wondering, what is the version? Given that, you know, I mean, as Greg was saying before, there might be a lot of different answers for a lot of different people. Yeah. But that's also not necessarily a, a I, marketing I, solution, right? Yeah. What is... Poets are the unacknowledged legislation as well. There's a marketing <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I think they'd be flattered. I was, I was, I was having lunch with, with Greg because I gave my lunch to Richard. That's uh, <laughs> true. And, and uh, I was, uh, I was telling Greg, I think what I, what, what I would like to do. Uh, Greg said, "Oh well, so what's your next book going to be? This is your next book you started." And I said, "No, I think what I want to do is try to, I want to try to take." Parts of this lecture, not the parts you didn't like. <laughs> parts of this lecture, and 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 try to try to walk the walk. I want to. So my answer is, I don't know yet, but I want to try to. I've only got a few years. Well, I only have years left. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to die, but I, I'm going to retire from some of the in the theory. I'd like to. I want to try to take the gist of some of this talk and see if I can write. Something that uh, you know, for a magazine or a paper, or something to try to get a broader audience to, to do the. I want to try to do the sort of create the kind of language I was saying. I think we need to create. Do I have it now? No. Did writing this talk help? Yeah. So well, what if it's not to the point? What if? What if? Well, then. What if? What if what we're talking about is the the. The crisis of humanities is collateral damage. 
and it's collateral damage in the growing uh, disruption of the relationship between the university and the economy. Yeah. Um, insofar as the growing expectation or demand for quite some time that the experience of higher education is primarily a vocational experience and that the cost of both society and individuals put into that experience has to be related right, to its economic function. This is not a critique of humanism. It's a, it's a demand that this institution that's evolving in our society function in a different way than it's primarily functioned before. Yeah. And that it didn't, it, it certainly wasn't expected to function that way for quite some time because it, it was it was really uh, just used by a small portion of the general po yeah. population. The expansion of the university and becoming a, a, a middle class experience in the 50s, 60s, and 70s meant that the tension grew between a mission that it once had and a mission that was emerging. And the emergence of the, that mission and the demand that it performed that is separate from the, the love that people have for Shakespeare. I mean, you're legislators, and I mean, these people are not against the humanities. What they don't understand is why the university as an institution should be a primary place where the study of the humanities takes place, given that the function of the university is not the curatorial conservation of our culture. That can happen lots of other places. But it's no longer, in their view, it shouldn't be the primary thing that's happening. I mean, you know, there's, the humanities are flourishing. What's not flourishing is the, is the funding of academic humanity humanities work. Correct. Right. So I mean just from a yeah. devil's advocate standpoint, I think we have to think about whether or not the arguments that we're mounting are addressing right the causes of whatever crisis yeah. we think we're in. Yeah, yeah. Those are all good points. Uh, but so I know we're out of time. Yeah, so how about if that was my privilege in order to hear Paul Vance join us there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>